So we are in this series called Faith Heroes, all right? And we've had different people give, uh, you know, talk about Daniel and David and John and all these great different faith heroes in the Bible. And the idea for us is to go from a personality to a character. You know, a personality looks good, smells good, is funny, entertaining. Our world's all about personalities. You know, personalities sell sneakers and sell soda and sell Chanel number no. five, and they're awesome. Um, now, characters are different, though. And the way I would define characters is, is, is this. A character is just simply somebody that has character. It's not all about fluff. It's not all about image. They do the right thing. They have integrity. They show up when they're supposed to. They're, they're loving in the relationships in their lives. Now, we've got a lot of different character qualities that we've thrown out. Today, I want to nominate what I think is the most important character quality. But before we get to that... There are all kinds of different character qualities that you think you need. And if, we're, if I were to sit down, we're at Starbucks and ask you, what's the most important character quality you need in a family or, or in a marriage or you know, in friendships? What's that most important character quality? I researched that a little bit this last week. And there are all kinds of different nominations. And, and I found an article, and it, says, it talks about this. What singles consider a must-have in a potential date? So what is the most important thing in a potential date? So before I, I'm going to give you some answers that, that might surprise you. Uh, but before I do that, I want you to turn to the person next to you and answer this question. What singles would consider is most important in a potential date? Answer it for guys. Answer it for girls. And we'll get back together in just a second. Okay, ready? Go. All right, all right. Anybody have anything? Anybody want to shout anything out at me? You know, you're that personality. You just have to, your opinion has to be known. What is it? No? Honestly, that's a good one. That's a great one. What? Sincerity. Sincerity. All right, all right. What? They're, that they're dressed? I mean, because you know right away if they're undressed, something's wrong. I mean, that is clearly key. Okay, the reason why I asked you this question is because I wanted you to just, you, you could not be more wrong in what you guessed. That's how I want you to feel. When I looked at this, this is USA Today, they interviewed a bunch of, we're gonna look at men. What singles, what looks at attraction turned off, what singles consider a must have, number one is teeth. They look at their teeth, and I don't think it's, that they have to have teeth. I mean, I think it's maybe that their teeth are in good shape, I don't know. Second is grammar. Third is hair. Fourth is clothes. Now, surely, surely the women must be deeper than that, right? I, I don't think so, look at this. 10 things women judge men most on are, number one is teeth again. Secondly is grammar. Third is clothes, fourth is hair. 
uh, down here somewhere is tattoos or have or not having tattoo. I don't know how they're going to judge you, whether you have one or whether you're not. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, whatever. If there was ever a graph that proved that our culture is all about personalities and not character, it's this one, right? Now, there was one other graph that kind of gave us a little bit more depth. Let's show that one. These are the top must-haves in a relationship. Men, someone I can trust and confide in, treats me with respect. Second, women, treats me with respect and someone I can confide in. It's just flipped. Now, what I found interesting is on the men list, that men have to have somebody who's physically attractive, that's not on the woman list anywhere. And I just felt like, you know, like with my wife, I'm just completely, she's, she's overlooking this great looking guy she has in her, it doesn't even matter to her. <laughs> now, if you're gonna come up with, with a list, I, I think we could probably come up with a better list than that, right? Like what's most important in relationships? Love has gotta be on that list, right? Compassion, I would think would be on that list. Somebody maybe who's honest, somebody who's trustworthy. Empathy, Empathy, that's a good one. Or teeth, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm all mixed up on this thing. But it feels like we could come up with a much better list than that. Today, I wanna nominate what I consider the most important character quality. And I'm not gonna tell you it right away, all right? Uh, and, and in fact, I even changed the, the notes so that you can't just look at the top and answer it because I know you're a bunch of cheaters. But we're going to look at what I think consider the most important character quality. And we're gonna, to do that, we're going to look into the life of a woman named Ruth. Now, every Bible hero we've looked at so far has all been men. And we're going to look at Ruth. And Ruth has a lot of great things to say. Ruth could not be more famous. She has an entire book of the Bible named after her. And there's one quality that she has, which is amazing, which is the reason why she's written up. So here's how I want us to start. I want you to bow your head. And I want you to think about your relationships right now. And my guess is that everybody in here, to a certain degree, has a relationship that's struggling. There's a relationship that you're fighting with right now. And so for the next few seconds, I'm going to leave it quiet. And I just want you to go before God and say, God, would you speak to me about this relationship? Maybe even want to, as you're praying, just mention that person by name. Say, man, I'm struggling with this. Would you speak to me? So just take 30 seconds and go before God. Lord God, a lot of different people from a lot of different places here today. We're all in a relationship and we're all in one that's just not going that great. And I pray that somehow you would speak to us in a way that's clear today. From this little known character in the Old Testament, but God, that you would speak to our hearts. So go before us, God, right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so if you got your Bible, open it up to the book of Ruth. Um, and if you don't know where the book of Ruth is, then open it up to the book called Table of Contents. Um, you start from the beginning, and you flip seven books in, you'll find a very small book. It's only four chapters long, and it tells all the story about this person named Ruth. Now, Ruth lived in a time when the judges ruled, okay? So the way the earth worked was God ruled, you know, for a while. He was the, he was the one person that they would look to for answers and then they got away from that, and then they were going to ultimately get to where kings were ruling over Israel. But in the meantime, in the middle time, they had these people called judges. And here's all you need to know about the time when the judges ruled. It's Judges 21:25 says this, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now, let me ask you, does that remind you of any time of life that you might be living in right now? And it feels like we're there, right? Whatever, whatever feels right to you, whatever's good to you. Well, that's the time of life that Ruth lived. Now, to give you some perspective, this was a difficult time to be a young, single woman on your own. 
when everybody's just doing whatever they want. Dangerous time of life. Ruth chapter 1 starts like this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Uh, so why is that significant? Here's why. Because famine basically happened based on you know, some rain records and, and rain patterns. And if there wasn't rain in your land, that meant that the crops didn't grow. And if the crops didn't grow, it meant you had nothing to eat, which today we would just ship away from some other part of the country and they'd send food in. But back then, it meant starvation. And it was a very real threat that you could starve and die if there was a famine in your land. And so in Israel, there was a famine, so this is what they did. Um, they went, so a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, they went to live in a while to a country of Moab, which is the, you know, the country next door. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Epaphrodites from Bethlehem, Judea. And they went to Moab and they lived there. Now, we don't understand what that's like to have to flee the country because you're not going to have enough food. But did you know that 795 million people in the world know what it's like to be hungry? And they go to bed hungry every night. It's not really our reality, but it was their reality. So they had to flee, run from everybody that they know. They're looking for food. They land in Moab and then things get worse. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, when she lost her husband, she was put in a very serious situation. Um, now, I have been told by my wife, I don't know if anybody's ever had this conversation with their wife, it's kind of a weird one. My wife has said this to me many times, you are not allowed to die before I do. Now, first, my first thought is, what kind of control do I have over that? Um, but and I think I know why she's saying that. We're good friends. She, tends to, she seems to like me. Um, that's one thing. We're partners. Um, I protect her in some ways, I guess. Um, I provide for her, although she's a pretty tough woman. She'd probably provide for herself if she needed to. Um, there are other reasons, I think, that she doesn't want me to go. I'm the only person that knows how to reset the Wi-Fi. Right? She gets confused on how to start the jacuzzi. Um, it's kind of a moving target, doesn't always remember how to do that. Uh, there, there are other things too. I don't know, any of you guys in charge of killing, killing bugs, you know, deadly bugs, spiders around your house, right? You're in charge of that. If the breakers, you know, blow, who has to go, you know, flip the breakers back on? That's my job. I'm sure some women know how to do that, but in our house, it's my job. I got a call from her a couple weeks ago. There was a, some smell in our house. You know, I don't know, carbon monoxide, come, here, come, honey, come walk through the house and smell it with me. Um, and actually, the more I started making this list, the more I realized how many different things on my list might hasten my death. <laughs> yeah, I think my wife might be trying to kill me. There, there are a lot of reasons why my wife wants me around. Much more serious in the time of Naomi because in the time of Naomi, the husband was literally the breadwinner. There were no jobs for women. The men had to make the money, had to provide the food. That was just the way it was. They had to provide protection. In this time and age where everybody did what they wanted, they, it wasn't just a figurative protector. The man held the weapon that kept people at bay. So Naomi's in trouble because her husband's gone. It could put her in a place of poverty and homelessness. Now, verse 4, her sons married Moabite women. One was named Orpah, the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, it got worse. Both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now, back in those days, the only, if the husband died, the boys had to step up, and the boys became protectors, and they became providers, right? Uh, my son's been home for a week, um, and if you've looked at him, if I went, he's he, he could protect her. Uh, in fact, a lot, he's been doing CrossFit, a lot better protector. Uh, he's also at law school, so, you know, I think if I died, she would, my wife would be raised up a couple economic levels, ultimately. Um, but that's what they had hoped, that, that the sons could step up and do the thing, provide for mom, that she couldn't provide for herself. And now, 
They are gone. So, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, providing food for them, she hears back home, hey, the, the, the drought's over, famine's gone, there's food. She and her daughter-in-law is prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So we're, I'm going home. And she intends to go alone. Verse 8, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Um, Here's your only hope, girls. I'm done. I can't help you. Go home. Find a man. I know in today's day and age that sounds weird, but really that was the only way that they could be find protection and be provided for. Verse 9, Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, Hey, we'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons that could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Can you imagine getting to this place in your life? You have lost your husband. You have lost your two sons. The only people you really know that are family are your two daughters. And she says, you got to go. I'm going this alone. She's got nobody at this point. Verse 14, at this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. Orpah decided to leave. I I think she started her own television station after that. (laughs) And a magazine where, strangely, her picture's on the cover of every, every episode. I'm not sure how that works, but... Uh, here's a fun fact. Did you know that Oprah is actually named after Orpah and her mom misspelled the name on the birth certificate? That's how she got her name, just so, so as you know that. thought you would like that fact. Now, look, if ever there was a good time to leave, this was it. And it's weird, because... Naomi paints this weird scenario of, hey, even if I were to have sons and they were to grow up, were they going to be, you know, you're going to marry those guys when they grow up? Which sounds really strange, except that you have to understand that back in those days, it was their habit that if a husband died, that the brother of the husband would marry the wife and bring her into his home to protect her. Now, ladies, think about that creepy brother-in-law you have. That would be weird, right? But this is a way to protect those women because they really had no protection. There's no reason to stay, ladies. I can't help you here. Verse 14. But Ruth clung to her. When was the last time somebody clung to you? Uh, It reminds me of when my kids were little, you know, four or five years old, and they just wrapped themselves around your leg. Dads, do you ever do this? You have a kid wrapped around your leg, and so you walk around with your kid wrapped around your leg. Uh, my kids are older. They don't cling to me like that anymore unless they want money. Um, and you can get this picture of Ruth in this death grip on Naomi. In verse 15, it says, Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. It makes kind of a weird statement. She's going back to her people and her gods. Each country had their own gods. In Moab, is called Shemosh. And Shemos is a god who's called a destroyer or a subduer. He was in the image of a fish. And so that was the god back in Moab. And Ruth is saying, look, I am not leaving you, and I'm not leaving your god either. It's a god decision for her to stay. And then Ruth makes one of the most famous statements in the entire Old Testament. Verse 16, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. When you die, I will die. I think that's what my wife wants for me. It's for us to die together. I'm not sure how we're going to work that out. 
There I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Listen to me. Lots of great characteristics, right? Man, I want somebody who's compassionate. I want somebody who's loving. I want somebody who's understanding. I want somebody who's honest. This is not going to lie to me. Those are all great characteristics. But if you ask me what is the number one characteristic for you to succeed in your marriage and with your kids and with your friendships, it's right here. And it simply sounds like this. I ain't leaving. As far as it depends on me, I am not leaving. I'm going to keep showing up. And it doesn't matter how ugly you get. I'm going to keep showing up. It doesn't matter how distant you get. I will continue to pursue you. It doesn't matter how hurtful your words are. I will keep showing up. That's number one. And that's what Ruth had going for. Look, man, that's what we need. Because there are times when your spouse is so into work and they're so distracted, it'd be so much easier just to forget it. I'm over this. Keep showing up. Say, I ain't leaving. I'm going to keep pursuing you. I'm going to keep trying for date nights. I'm going to do whatever it takes. You got kids that grow up, man. When they're eight, they cling to your leg. When they're 13, not so much. And it can be rude and mean. And it's all part of it, right? It's all part because they need to grow up and get out of the house. This is your, their way of letting you know that you're going to be happy when they go out of the house. That's hard. You yeah, keep showing up. And that friend that says something bad about you, you just keep hanging in there. That's my nomination for the characteristic that I think is most important. Now let me say, tell you something real quick. If you are being physically abused, I am not saying this is for you. If your spouse is a repeat offender and just leaves you and, and cheats on you over and over, I'm not saying that this isn't for everybody. I get that. There are times when you are abused and the best thing for you is to leave. I get it. But I'm telling you, if you want to succeed in your relationships, whenever it is possible, don't leave. Now let me show you how it turns out in Ruth's life. All right? That's how it pays off. Look at verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? She's been gone forever. Can this be Naomi? And Naomi greets them like this. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life bitter. That's what Mara means. It means bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Now, we, we've heard of people changing their names, right? This is, this is definitely a personality thing to do, to change your names. Uh, for example, Marilyn Monroe did not start her life off as Marilyn, all right? Nobody names their child Sting. It did not happen. People change their names. Um, let's, have a little fun. Ooh, let's have a little fun with this. See if you can name this person. You know who Mark Sinclair is? Did you go to a Mark Sinclair movie? How about this guy? You'd go to a Vin Diesel movie, wouldn't you? Oh, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you're smarter than that. <laughs> but Vin Diesel does sound better, doesn't it? Uh, do you know who Carlos Erwin Estevez is? Anyone? It's Charlie Sheen. Even with a cool name, I'm not going to his movie, though. How about Eric Marlin Bishop? No, wait, wait, that's not him. Oh, let me give you the next one. The next one is Margaret, Mary, Emily, and Hira. Okay, do you know who that is? Right here. Meg Ryan. She went from 25 letters to seven. Good move, don't you think? Okay, Eric Marlin Bishop. Jamie Foxx with two X's. Just to be extra cool. Do you know who Pete Jean Hernandez is? Bruno Mars. Hey, when these people change their names, what do they do? They upgrade. They get a better name. 
and Naomi shows back up. You know what Naomi means? Naomi means pleasant. And she, go, she gets back to town and says, man, I ain't pleasant anymore. I'm bitter. And maybe that's the reason why you have a hard time showing up in this person's life is because they are just bitter. And Ruth says, man, I'm not leaving you. I'm going to hang in there with you. Now, if you look, chapters 2 and 3 tell this love story. Um, basically, they send Ruth out to this barley field, and she's going to reap the extra barley that's left on the ground. And the guy who owns the field is named Boaz, and they fall in love. And I don't want to tell you the story. It sounds like a Hallmark movie, you know. Boyfriend in a barley field, starring Cameron Candice Bure. You know, um, you can read that later if you want. But basically, God sends Boaz as a redeemer to Ruth. And if you flip to the end, you see how it pays off. Ruth 4.13. They decided to get married. Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, you probably didn't notice this earlier, but Ruth was married for 10 years. No baby. That's a story. There's a lot of history there. Now she's bouncing a little baby on her knee. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth him birth that Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him notice that nobody is calling her mara gets better the woman living there said Naomi has a son and they named him Obed which is an odd choice um, but Obed was the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of David. You know who David is? David the giant killer. David the future king of Israel. And not only that, but Ruth and Obed and Jesse and David are in the line in which Jesus came. Ruth's great-grandson was David who killed Goliath. Look, when we look at the story of Ruth, there, there's a lot of People read into it, right? They look at Ruth and go, wow, man, she must have been really loving and really compassionate. She must have been, you know, some of the guys are going, yeah, this is a love story, right? She must have been hot, right? This is, she must have been really good looking. We don't know any of that. The Bible doesn't say that it, Ruth has any other characteristics except one. Only one. Read it. See if you can find another one. I couldn't. And the only characteristic she had that brought her to this place was this. I ain't leaving. No matter how hard it gets, I'm not leaving. No matter how difficult my kid gets, I'm not leaving. No matter how hard it is with my husband, I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. Listen, here's my challenge. Just keep showing up, man. Just keep showing up. It's not better out there. It's not better with somebody else. Yeah, I know your kid doesn't like you right now. I know it's hard. I know they're being difficult. You just keep showing up. That's all you can do. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to keep showing up. So here's what I'd like you to do. Why don't you bow your head? Maybe just say this, God, I'm making a declaration right now that in my relationships, I will continue to show up as long as it depends on me. You know, I know there are people whose spouses have left them. I can't, can't help you there. But as long as it depends on me, I will keep showing up. And I'm not leaving. Lord God, I pray that you would bless these people for making that decision. And I'll tell you something, man, it's, sometimes it gets tough. You know, I've put three kids through, well, I got now four, teenage years. 
But when they come back, it's amazing if you keep showing up. Okay, one more challenge. While every head is bowed, let me tell you something. There is a God out there that will keep showing up for you. No matter what you do, he's there. No matter how you sin, he's there. No matter what decisions you make sexually, no matter what habits that you have, no matter what addictions that you've fallen into, he is a God that will keep showing up no matter how difficult you make it on him. And if you want to be in a relationship with that God, it starts like this. You just pray this in the quietness of your own heart. Say, dear God, I give my life to you. Thank you that you keep showing up for me. Enter into my life. I want to follow you. Let me tell you, you do that. It changes your life. All that old sin is gone. New life for you. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you that you never stop showing up for us. I pray that we would learn that from you and do that in our relationships. In your name we pray. Amen.